So this image on screen right now was in the article. Right. And uh, could you help explain to me and the audience what IHME was trying to explain in this graph? Yeah. So, I mean, what this graphic is really showing is the gap between what they refer to as health adjusted life expectancy or HAIL um, and life expectancy. So life expectancy is pretty obvious. That's just the, the length of life that the average person is expected to live. Um, HAIL is this little bit more complicated, in fact, a lot more complicated metric that is supposed to be a quantitative measure of health span. And what the graphic shows is that uh, the gap between those two numbers, so how long we expect people to live and how long we expect people to live in a healthy state, has gone from about 10.8 years in 1990 to 12.7 years today. And again, as I mentioned, I think that's an underestimate. But I think it reflects the fact that there is this growing gap between health expectancy and life expectancy. So you think the graph is underestimating the true scale of the pro problem? So what would you say to that? Yeah, again, I think um, a little bit has to do with the use of this health-adjusted life expectancy interchangeably with health span, and I think that's a mistake. Um, and and as I've said before, I would argue that health span really is a qualitative term. And what I mean by that is we don't have a consensus way to actually measure health span. Um, and I think part of that is because health is not binary. It doesn't go from, you know, full health one day to no health the next day, if, at least for most people. It's really a continuous variable that changes over the life course. It can even go up and down uh, as people go through different experiences. So Hale is really an uh, effort to overcome this by creating a, a quantitative measure of health. And um, the way they do this is really complicated. I actually wasn't able to find a single formula that, that, um, that, gave the exact calculation for Hale, but basically it's a uh, combination of weighting different diseases and disabilities that different people may have based on, you know, a, a somewhat ambiguous severity estimation to get a single number of health. Um, and so one of the problems is that, again, I don't really think that this Hale metric matches any reasonable or commonly accepted definition of health span or really health or what we would consider good health. So why would they use something like Hale then? Yeah, I mean, I think the obvious reason is they wanted to have something they could measure. And I agree with that. That's important. I think there are a couple of other factors here that that may have um, complicated the way that, that Hale was developed. Um, one could be that there is this expectation that older people are supposed to be in poor health compared to young people. Um, and so this is sort of adjusted for instead of considering health on an absolute scale. In other words, you know, what we would call poor health in a 30-year-old might be considered good health in a 60-year-old. Um, and I, I actually think that's a mistake if you're trying to come up with a calculation that's supposed to reflect some quantitative metric of health. And I, the, other, the other thing that I think about, and I don't know for sure if this is true, but I do wonder if Hale you know, um, is in some ways an effort to be a little bit politically correct. And what I mean by that is not define anyone who has a disability or a disease as having less than good health. And again, I get the rationale for that, um, but I, I don't know that that's helpful if we really want to accurately measure health trends. Yeah, so it sounds like to me that we don't have a great way of quantifying health span. So do you have a suggestion what we could do? Yeah, I mean, I think there's a couple of approaches here that I've thought about. Um, one, I talked about in an article I published a few years ago, and the title of that article was How Healthy is the Health Span Concept? And in that case, I proposed that we develop a quantitative metric of health, which is kind of what Hale is. Again, I don't I don't agree with the way Hale calculates health, but you could you could come up with something. But then track that quantitative metric over the life course, right? So what you really get, if you plotted that out, would be a curve where we've got this health metric on the y-axis and chronological age on the x-axis. And then you could look at something like the area under that curve as a single metric proxy for health span, right? So that's one approach. Another approach would be just to kind of reframe the discussion away from health span, again, the problem with talking about health span is health doesn't go from one to zero, right? There's, there's, it's, it's continuous, uh, and we could talk about something like six span, which would, which would then define six span as the period of life spent with at least one 
chronic disease or disability. And maybe we would say significant chronic disease or disability. So there's still a little bit of ambiguity there because we'd have to define what we mean by significant, but I'm confident that 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 there that we could reach consensus in the field about you know what would fall into significant disease or disability. And then six span becomes very easy to calculate. It's just the period of life spent with one or more of these chronic diseases or disability. Um, the nice thing about this definition is it is binary. So it's pretty easy to calculate and there's, there's not a lot of ambiguity about what we mean. So if we use that definition of six span, what does this gap look like? Yeah, right. So this is where I think it gets interesting. And this is why I, I uh, suggest that, that, that the 12 years in the Wall Street Journal article is a pretty massive underrepresentation. So, you know, if we just look at a couple of statistics, right? Um, one from the CDC, uh, and this is a direct quote from their website, 60% of Americans live with at least one chronic disease, like heart disease and stroke, cancer, or diabetes. Okay, so by my definition of six span, right, this would suggest that at least 60% of Americans are in that period of life where six span has started. Okay. The other statistic here that's relevant is just the median age of the population in the United States. So according to the Census Bureau, the median age is 38.1 years. So that means 50% of Americans are under 38.1 years old. 50% of Americans are older than 38.1 years old. So if we just look at those two statistics, 60% have a chronic disease or disability. 50% are over 38.1 years, it's pretty clear that six span on average starts at less than 38.1 years. So even if we use 38.1 years as the point at which for the average American six span begins, that tells us that the difference between 38.1 and average life expectancy is a lot more than 12 years. Yeah, and that kind of makes sense when you consider what, up 40% of Americans are obese? Yeah, I mean, I think that statistic's true. So that would suggest that the gap is probably closer to 40 years than the 12.7 that they recommended. Yeah, exactly. So so I think that's exactly right. Um, and again, you know, we could have a discussion about is that a good definition of how we would define somebody as not being in good health? I think absolutely nobody could argue with the statement that having a chronic disease or disability is less than optimal health. And I would argue that it's probably not what we would consider good health. So if we go with that definition, then yeah, it looks like the gap right now is around four decades. Okay, so given the current trends, where do you see this going in the future? Right, so that's that's the big question. And, and I think it's, um, it's hard to know. So I would suggest that, you know, where this gap goes in the future really depends on two things uh, at, at the most basic sense what happens to life expectancy and what happens to six span. Um, so if we look at life expectancy, um, I think it's kind of unclear. Uh, over the last three or four decades, there's been a pretty dramatic increase in life expectancy in the United States and other developed countries around the world. Um, that kind of stopped about five or six years ago and started to plateau. And then with COVID-19, there's actually a drop in life expectancy in the United States. Um, and I think we don't know where it's going to go from here. You know, some people predict that life expectancy is going to start going up again. Some people predict it's going to kind of plateau. Other people predict it's going to go down. I really don't have a good guess as to what's going to happen. Um, and I think this may be a case where, you know, the United States may go on a different trajectory than a lot of the rest of the developed worlds. You know, we have some systemic problems in our society around drug use and uh, inequities in healthcare that could impact life expectancy going forward. So I think we'll just have to see. Um, so the other piece here, though, is what's going to happen to six span or health span, depending on how you want to think about it. And again, I don't know. I mean, I think there's there's positive and negative pressures here on uh, population level trends in health. Um, I do think there are some reasons to be optimistic. And so, you know, I'd point to advances in cancer in particular. So both at the level of new screening methods, imaging, liquid biopsies, combined with uh, immunotherapy for cancer. I think there's real reason for optimism that uh, chronic sickness and mortality due to cancer is going to decrease in the coming years. Um, obesity, you mentioned. I think that's another place where there's some reason for optimism. You know, after 
decades of seeing you know very little hope when you look at the obesity trends, we now have these drugs, the GLP-1 agonists, that are pretty effective at helping people lose weight. And I think we're seeing new generations of anti-obesity drugs in the pipeline. So um, we don't know yet what the long-term efficacy or, or potential downsides to those drugs are, but right now it looks pretty promising. Um, and so that could have a, 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 an, a positive effect on not just obesity, but all of the other diseases of aging that go along with obesity. Um, and then I think uh, another reason why I'm somewhat optimistic is the science of aging, right? The discoveries that are coming out of the field of geroscience um, that that we are now understanding the biology of aging in a much more sophisticated way, starting to develop therapies that can actually target that biology um, and can potentially have an outsized impact on health span and potentially life expectancy, but health span in particular. And I would say this is a fundamentally different approach than what has been done before, where typically biomedical research uh, pharmaceutical discovery has been focused on trying to treat individual diseases in isolation. If we can target the biology of aging, we can have an impact on all of the functional declines and diseases of aging simultaneously. And I talk more about this in the episode on um, understanding aging and disease. And then the fourth reason for optimism I would suggest is that I think we are finally starting to see a shift in mindset away from traditional reactive disease care towards more proactive preventative health care. I'm not naive enough to think that, you know, that's happening quickly or that it's going to be easy, but we're seeing more people talk about it. And I think that's the start. And clearly that's our mission at Optispan is to hasten that transition as much as we can by enabling as many people as possible to become empowered to take control of their own health. And so in my view, that's really the most impactful way right now for us to start narrowing this gap and really start to push that health span curve out as far as possible.